please enjoy this demonstration from one of my live online watercolor classes where I paint this rose. And it's a portion of the demonstration. If you took my class, you get to see the whole thing. And if you think you'd like to join one of my classes, I have links below where you can do that and find out more information. But I'll also talk about it after the video is finished. Enjoy. Okay, so we're ready to start our second week painting flowers. And last week we got a good start on our rose and our uh, water lily. And they're really looking very good, actually, just as they are, which is kind of fun. And um, so let's look at the references again and just sort of talk about the game plan. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So last week we got our, you know, uh, initial layers of the, the golden undertones in this rose, the shadow, and then we got a good like variegated green background to get us started. So today I want to start doing the reds in this um, piece. And I'm kind of excited to do the edges are kind of a fun thing to do. But there's this area in the middle of the rose, and I kind of touched on it last time where I was sort of confused as to how to approach it. And it's because this red color is doing a lot of the gradation that's making the forms. And so I am going to start there before I start doing the deep saturated colors, um, because once I start the saturated colors, I don't really want to play with them very much. I want to leave them alone. Red is one of those colors that um, really does better the less you fiddle with it. The more you fiddle with it, the more it starts to not look good. <laughs> I'll also say that, but it just doesn't. It's just one of those colors that's real finicky that way. Now there's some things you can do that help you when you do need to sort of finagle it or move it around. And one of those is if you're doing um, the two brush technique on top of painted red is to load your blending brush with that same red so that if you accidentally you know, lift off the red or move it around, you sort of put the red back at the same time instead of just using clear water. I don't know that I'll be doing that too much on this particular flower. So it's got a good start and I really love the way that the shadows turned out. They're, they just look really kind of great already. In some ways, I almost wish it was done, but it does need a little bit more. And I am looking forward to doing the red um, two-tone edges. <clears throat> So I am going to start looking at the middle of the flower and it, like I said, there is some, there's a, like a red color that's creating some of the forms of these inside petals, especially. And like over here, it's a little pinker over here. It's almost in the terracotta range. So I, I think I'm going to use some of my burnt sienna to do that my palette situated use the burnt sienna to, to do some of these forms. And then once those areas are done, then I'll go in with my saturated red because I don't want to <clears throat> be messing around with the areas around those saturated reds. I wanna be pretty solid that that's what's happening and we're just gonna leave it alone. So that's sometimes easier said than done, but that's my plan. So I'm gonna start with, Go ahead and activate my palette really quick. And I've got my burnt sienna right here. A little too wet right now because I just squirted it, but we're just going to move along. Hopefully, dry my brush off a bit. Okay, so since this area is very complicated and it's easy to get lost in here, I'm going to remind myself that I'm painting forms and shapes. I'm not painting petals. So it helps me to get in the right headspace. I'm also going to start with areas where I'm a little clear as to the shapes I'm seeing, where they go and how they connect to the other shapes. Um, you know, set myself up for some success rather than making this hard to start with. Sometimes that helps when you are painting something really complicated is to um, paint what you're sure about, and then hopefully the context that you're building as you work your way around that form will continue to add to the confidence you have moving forward as you're working on your re reference. And some of the questions I have 
I'm just going to have to sort of make some decisions and that's kind of a clearer shape. And then also be okay with not being exact. Um, you know, if you're kind of the same personality or similar to me, you like, like the challenge of recreating what you see, but sometimes it's good to just know that you've got to have that artistic license and it helps you um, just to have that um, piece about, you know, it's okay if you don't quite get it right or if you miss a spot and you have to sort of jiggle things around a little bit. And I know that's going to happen in here because my drawing's really light and I think I probably could have made it a little more clear and that's okay. But, so that's on me. But um, I'm going to also, as I'm painting here, I'm thinking about possibly even simplifying some of the forms I see so that it will read the same when you're looking at the the finished painting, but it's going to, you know, just make make my my journey more pleasant and a little easier as the artist. Okay, I'm just sort of checking different landmarks I have for myself. I think that's a good start. Next, I want to grab some of my uh, <clears throat> permanent rose and I've got some on my palette already mixed with a little bit of purple to kind of calm it down. And this was from another painting, but I think it's perfect for some of the areas I want to paint right now. So I'm just going to reactivate that on my palette and do those before I do my um, saturated red. Now, in some of these areas, just to be a placeholder and kind of help me know what's going on in sections, I can paint this pink underneath areas I know are going to be red. Some of those areas, the pink kind of peaks around the red anyway. And if I need to do that with this color to help me, you know, visually understand the forms I'm seeing, that's actually a really nice tool. So remember that when you've, when you've got a complicated, really um, particular form like this, you can use a color that you feel a little less trepidatious about to get you started and help you create the forms you're seeing. I can already tell I'm going to get in here and just simplify a lot of what I see because I think partly I, <laughs> I did that in my drawing and I forgot that I had done that or I just got tired and <laughs> stopped drawing all the petals I saw, which is, it's a, you know, it's a choice. Okay. Again, I'm just using my second brush to soften edges. I want to keep clear, sharp edges on some edges of the or parts of the petal and then some areas as it folds or um, moves in space, changes value. I'll use that clean brush to soften the edge to create a, a light gradation and then a softer edge. And again, I don't want to erase the color I paint. I just want to touch an edge, or sh like the shape of the color I'm painting. Okay. I think that's a pretty good start for the middle. Um, what I'm seeing for the rest of the middle, I think I need to do with the red. I'm going to look around the outer petals and see if there's anywhere that I want to get this pink peeking around. And then <clears throat> I might start a little bit on the outside while this is drying 
just to give it a minute to dry and be Hmm. I'm seeing some spots, but I'm not sure if I just want the red to soften or if I want it to truly turn into the pink. Maybe in a couple of spots, we'll see if the red, if this pink will be something that'll be nice to peek through or if it'll just get eaten by this really saturated red. I have a feeling it's going to get eaten. That's okay. So I'm not going to do a lot of that. I really like the yellow and pink together already just by themselves. I love, that's my favorite color combination on roses is the yellow and pink or the yellow and orange peachy ones. I just think they're so pretty. Okay, while this is setting up fully, it'll just need a couple of minutes to dry. I'm not gonna, I don't think it'll need to be under the fan. So I'm just, while it's drying, I'm going to work a little bit around what's uh, going on in the background. And this kind of background, I did wet on wet. I added a little bit of salt. I, you know, we had some blooming happening, really great organic shapes, which lends itself to the idea of foliage around and behind the, the flower, the bloom, which is the center of the, the focal point. Now there are some petals that come directly out of the, the rose that have their own structure and um, importance. And so I want to pull those out of the, the, the sort of chaotic feel of what we've going on right now. And one thing, I, one way I can do that is to use negative space. I've got, I should have cleaned up my palette a little bit, but I've got some hookers green and I'm just adding a little bit of this brown to it to make it go just a bit darker. And I can see some of my, my pencil lines where I've given myself an idea of where these leaves are, but I'm just going to jump in and start getting some of these structures that I see in these leaves. I'm basically pulling out these particular edges. Again, using that technique of creating a hard edge and a soft edge. So the softer edge will visually blend a little bit into the background. Now I can encourage that more here in a minute and I, you know, maybe by making this shape turn into, you know, floral-esque shapes a little bit more. I don't want it to be too structural because I really just want these particular leaves to stand out. But we'll see, we can, we can tweak and move and adjust as the painting moves along as well. Here's the other edge of this leaf that I'm starting to pull out of the background. And then the start of another over here. I don't really want there to be like this dark halo effect. So I'm gonna have to be a little bit careful about how I'm um, doing this, <clears throat> coming in and out like that. This leaf, there's a leaf right here that's smaller and it's got a little bit of a shadow on it. I'm going to see if I can do, use that shadow to create an edge, part of the edge. And then use the inside of the leaf, a little bit of hooker screen by itself to create the edge. Just directly painting the subject matter, which is positive space, like you would sort of initially think you would paint something. I'll just bring this green in and it gives that a little bit of shape. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm loving how this is going, but it's it's going somewhere. So I need to work on this leaf here and I'll do the same thing. I'll grab some of this hooker's green and I'm going to add some of the positive space, but letting the background color still come in into the leaf. Another thing you can do when you're doing this technique is to not complete the um, 
outline or the edge all the way around the object that you're pulling out of the background. And I think I might have, I think I should have done that a little bit with this because it's feeling a little bit too green halo-y. So I'm going to try and adjust the color of what I'm using to pull an edge as well and see if that kind of breaks that up just a little bit and helps it integrate into the background a little bit more. So there are ways to kind of play with the space, play with um, colors and shapes. And these leaves here are definitely secondary colors. I don't want to have a ton of detail in them. I don't want them to over overpower the bloom. I don't think they can. This bloom is going to be pretty, pretty intense by the time I get done with it. Push that shadow a little bit. There's not a lot of, of leaf happening here and then just a little bit more and then the stem kind of uh, sneaks in here. So we've got some more shadowy direct shapes here again, like here with these leaves. And I'm really happy about that because that that's kind of my favorite part of how these two turned out. I might even push this back into the background a little bit more. It's bugging me a little bit. We'll see how it, maybe it needs more context and it'll make sense. This is again that hooker's green mixed with some sepia and burnt umber, maybe a little bit of burnt umber in there too. It's a little dark, but we're going for drama, right? Okay. And then the leaf continues here, but I'm going to go ahead and get these dark shapes in first since I've got it on my brush. And they're very sharp graphic shapes. I don't have to really blend them or help them fit in on something so they can be very sharp and stand alone, which is nice. And I can just keep painting along. Okay, and then one more over here. And it's a little bit lighter, so I think I am going to add a little bit more of the Hooker screen to the mix. Yeah. It's going to be subtle, but maybe it'll be good. Okay. I'm going to pull some more of this green into this shape. To give it a little bit of depth so it's not quite so flat and then here again the same just a little bit more dark green yes that's nice now i can use a, a more standard more direct green to paint the shapes of these leaves we'll see if that works they may feel too disjointed let's be a little bit of an experiment I think that'll work. And this particular leaf has a little bit of a backlight, so the edges are white. And I, I don't really have a chance to do that since I painted the background. And I'm not going to worry about reproducing that. I'm not sure if that's really reading as one anyway. There's a little bit of a stem that goes, or not a stem, but like a vein that goes through. Maybe that'll connect them a little bit better. And... This guy. Hmm. Okay. And then back in here, like, in the photograph, the stem is like rendered right here, but since I cropped it so close, I'm going to pull the stem implica implication right back here instead. I may even add a little bit of a thorn. They're fun. Thorns are fun. 
I could go darker with that in the photograph. It's almost black. I'm just going to leave that there as a placeholder for now. And yeah, I think, you know, the leaves need a little bit of attention, but they're all right for now. This guy's feeling, I don't really like it very much. So while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to take some, like take my little scrubby brush blender and I'm going to add some of this darker green onto it. And I'm going to try to obscure the way that this leaf is in space. And what I mean by that is I'm just going to make it not as clear where it stops and starts um, because I just didn't really like the way it looked. So I'm going to push it back into the background a bit because I just didn't, wasn't feeling it. And because I have this really abstract background, it's disappearing very nicely. Now I can leave a little bit of implication that there's a leaf shape over here. I kind of like that this is blooming a bit. That'll be a nice shape to imply that there's a leaf, but it's not as clearly shown. I'm still not 100% loving this. I can still work on this more, but for all intents and purposes, that'll work. I think if it's framed and matted, no one will even care about the leaves too much. But once they're dried and situated and I have more context, I'll have more information on how to make them better. So let's grab some of this red before I run out of time. And start, I'm going to work with a smaller brush. I'm going to start with my little number four. I have my blender brush ready and I'm going to use my Windsor Red just like straight up. And my goal is to get these shapes established in two passes or less, preferably in one. There's a couple of places where I'm going to need to go darker, like the very center. But I think I'll be able to go to get these, you know, basically in one. And really, it's just because the color, this color just doesn't like to be played with very much. It doesn't like to be messed with. And I'm going to start in the center and work my way around, hopefully to help me not lose my place for one thing. And I'm going to try to make my marks deliberate and confident. So again, I won't feel like I need to get in there and, you know, tweak them. All right. I'm not sure, sure what I'm looking at. So I'm just guessing on some of this visual information again, that same problem was coming up. So I may need to go in with like an oxblood red or a little bit of purple to um, clarify these folds. But I think I can do that with just a little bit of a hint of stuff. Now we start to get into these funny little shapes where I'm not, again, sure what's coming and going. And some of these are a little bit more in the pinky, pinky red range and softer. So I'm going to pull out my blender brush and very gently make some choices. Okay, so far so good, I think. Now, as you're doing your brush work, you know, don't forget that you don't have to just move your brush in one direction, one pressure, or I should say one pressure for a certain kind of line. As you're moving along, push your brush in, lift it off, let the um, sort of, what's the right word? You know, be gentle, be firm. And that will make your brush strokes more sophisticated and also let those brush strokes do a lot of this work for you. So you don't have to go in and create these forms if the brush stroke, you know, by going 
the sensitivity of the lines you're creating will, you know, help create the story you're trying to tell. In some places. Oops, I think I went. I didn't know what I was looking at right there. So I'm going to get that off. This particular red is, like I said, I just lifted that entire little section right off. No problem. It's, you know, red stains, obviously. But this particular Windsor red is sitting on top of the paper, which you know, like I just showed you, I can lift the color off if I'm not, you know, if I made a mistake or I want to change what my choice. Um, but because it sits on top of the paper and lifts off very easily, it does not like to be messed with. So that's why I keep saying that kind of over and over again and is, you know, also get to know your pigments. Different brands sometimes act a little bit differently, but sometimes the mineral content is consistent across brands certain uh, mineral colors, you know, are going to just act the same no matter what um, combination of chemicals and bases and binders and whatever a company uses, they just will. I've had very good luck with sepia that way. It's, I've tried about three different brands and um, I won't, one was a little bit different, but the other two acted very similar. And I was very happy that, you know, I didn't have to be surprised in a bad way. Now, the trick with something like this rose is, you know, you have these very bright, very graphic moments with these flowers and making those graphic bright reds, especially in this, fit into the whole of the structure of the flower without feeling like they're stuck on can be a little bit of a challenge. And I'm seeing a couple of moments where I'm thinking, I don't know if that's going to you know, read like I want it to, and it, you know, might not. So I may have to go in and adjust based on the context. I'm, you know, more information as I'm painting. So keep that in mind. Just remember to be flexible as you paint. You may have to make some changes along the way you hadn't anticipated. Just because of the way that translating your subject matter with this particular medium is just happening. Sometimes that's just a challenge in any kind of painting. I like working from photographs um, because <clears throat> it allows me a long look at my subject matter. And what I mean by that is I can look very long and very closely at something that's not moving. So if I just sat down in my backyard and I had a rose bush and wanted to paint some of the flowers, I would approach it very differently because I would not be allowed a long look because the wind would blow them. Um, you know, they're just, they're not static entities. They move. And you know, if you want a particular style of painting or something like that, uh, that may not work. But like I said, I would just change how I would approach it. I would, I would be looser. I would be more impressionistic. And that's great. Just keep that in mind. I find that some people are, you know, very much prejudice, prejudice against using photographs, but, you know, for certain things, I think they're superior. 
And then for certain things, they're not just like everything. There's no real absolutes. I don't think in anything really. Okay. I think it's coming along nicely. I'm starting to see it and understand it's, it's the way that things are landing in space. Um, I'm also seeing places where my drawing isn't quite right and I missed a pedal here and there and, and I'm trying not to dwell too much on that. I think that Michael looks that. great. Oh, thank you. It looks you a know. lot better than mine. <laughs> oh no. Well, I don't know about that, but I, you know, roses are, I, I enjoy them, but they're also just this like, I almost love to hate them because they're just so complicated. But if you're if you're okay with you know delving into them, sometimes the reward is worth it. The the <laughs> the pain of trying to you know pick it apart. Okay, I think I'm going to just keep moving out. <clears throat> um, the center's reading okay for me. Again, like there's a few moments where I'm like, I don't think that's quite right. But as I'm just looking at it, trying to be a more objective, <clears throat> like if I didn't know, if I wasn't looking right at my reference at the same time, I think I would be like, oh, okay, I buy it. So <clears throat> that's another thing to remember is, you know, you don't have that reference as I'm <laughs> fiddling because I can't stand it. You won't have that reference next to your painting 99.9% .9 of the time, as I like to say. Um, so don't be so hard on yourself. <clears throat> Or you shouldn't, for goodness sake, unless that's the whole point of your, <clears throat> excuse me, exhibition is to paint. And I feel like if, if that's the case and you want to compare how closely you, you painted to a photograph, then you're actually painting the photograph more than you're painting the subject matter. And that's a little bit convoluted, but... Um, it's, it's kind of a thing. Some people paint photographs. They're called photorealists. And their paintings aren't like how a human eye sees. They're how a camera eye sees. Because, you know, you've seen mm, those. Paintings, good point. Yeah, you've seen those paintings of people that are photorealistic and you see every pore in their face. Like, I have never seen every pore in anyone's face, much less my own. So, yeah. Um, while it's fascinating and, and who wants to, <laughs> I know sometimes I'm like, I really think I don't need to see all the pores in this person's face, but, but it's, but it, you know, it's still like an accomplishment and it's, there's a beauty in it, but it's, I don't think people really talk about enough that that is a painting of a photograph. It's less of a painting almost than the subject matter. So, and that's, a, it's not, I'm not saying that's bad, it, it, but it is something worth kind of noting. Like, oh, okay. I try to paint my, I try to, for me, I try to use the photograph as a tool to help me understand how my subject matter, you know, is affected by light and the space it's in. And also, you know, it's, it's sort of personality, even if it's an inanimate object, you know, I'm trying to capture its essence, right? Uh, now, do I delve into painting the photograph? Of course I do. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to avoid if you're painting from or using photographs as a tool. But um, recreating what I've, I photographed is not my intention. I do. I'm fascinated by people who are really good at it. When I was in grad school, there was a young man from Africa, from Ghana. I think that, I'm pretty sure it was Ghana. And he would do these beautiful oil paintings of these people um, and just absolutely stunning work. But, you know, photograph, photorealism. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that was so frustrating in grad school is I just watched him, you know, the professors really, they're like, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but let's paint on cardboard and, um, you know, paint blisters on feet and stuff, which is, it's cool because he was his, his whole, he wanted to do paintings about um, migration from his country to Italy. And I didn't know this, uh -huh. but it's practically like a rite of passage that young people, especially young men would make this trip. But 
I think he said it's like 50% chance you'll make it alive. It was crazy, but it was like, it was almost expected of you at a certain age, you try, you try, you try to cross <laughs> in these, well, you know, you, you basically have a life jacket and a raft trying to get to Italy to get a job. And he's like, wow. I'm in America. I, I went to school, so I didn't have to do that. But my friends did, and some of them are, are dead. And and I was just shocked. And I was like, yes, you need to make art about this because that's, I feel like that's a really important thing. Anyway. To let people but, know. Yes. So, you know, I think that's so, what's, you know, what's so great about art is we can do that in a way that is different than just, you know, hearing about numbers or facts from a news report. Anyway. But he's, I think he's going to graduate this fall and I'm really proud that he's still in the program. He's going to make it out and, but he's already a master painter. I mean, when I saw what he came in being able to do, I was like, oh my gosh, we are so lucky to have him in our program. Please don't scare him away. Yeah. (laughs) Please don't ruin him. Um, But yeah, anyway. I still appreciate people who have that technical mastery over a medium because not everybody does. And that's okay. There are people who are so good at abstraction and impressionism, you know, that I'm just in awe of them as well. And that's just a different kind of technical mastery. Okay. As I'm working on these, um, I'm looking at my photograph of my subject matter and trying to sort of analyze what, how these, this variegation is like reacting on these petals. And it's, it's really interesting. Sometimes it almost looks like linear and then sometimes it's very granular. And so my first pass, I'm just kind of doing that scumbling technique along some of the places where it looks more granular. And then I'm pulling out in a few places it looks linear. I think I'm going to need to go in and soften moments because it's not jiving with me yet. That's okay. But I'm just sort of making that observation. What time is it? Oh dear. Okay. All right. So I think what I need to do since I have 15 minutes left of class and I've been absorbed in this rose is um, stop and do that. So I'm going to take my blender brush and I'm going to go in and I'm going to soften not consistently, but sort of um, let the water and the paint organically kind of do that for me. I'm not going to do any softening with any particular um, intention. I'm going to let that just kind of happen. And hopefully that will look more natural than if I'd gone in and be like, I want it to look, you know, I don't want to obliterate the texture I've made. And I want it to look more like it it is in nature so i'm just gently reactivating these edges and letting some of them be softer than others and i'm not even looking at my photograph at this point for that guidance i'm just going to let the water and the paint do their thing trusting that sometimes when you let the paint you know like in wet on wet if you just like let it go and you're it can just do so many more beautiful things than if you tried to control it all the way around. Sure. And so true. I, think, I think it's working for me. I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling it a little bit more. I like that better. Now, you know, to finish this part up, I definitely am going to do a little bit of that and a little bit of this on these petals. You know, once I get the outer petals, um, you know, variegated and get that context, that will help me to know how to finish the center of the flower. But I have these moments in the inside of these petals where there's these like delicate, I'm just going to take a little bit of like a hint of Payne's gray in my brush. And I think that's probably too much Payne's gray. I mean, just like a little hint of it and do these very delicate little moments and some of them are just so subtle you definitely want to just imply 
and then I'm probably going to soften again because I just, that was too harsh. Really, really subtle moments to just give the, the petals just another hint of what that texture is and what is happening. And it's mixing a little bit with the red, somewhat from my brush and somewhat just from the paper. And I, and I think that's helping this gray very much. So I kind of like that. Okay, I don't want to spend too much more time on this because I do want to work on that water lily before we move on tonight. Okay, do you have any questions before I kind of move on from this? <sighs> I guess um, <clears throat> I guess not. You know, I think <clears throat> the fact that it's so stark in the colors, it it's kind of hard to recreate recreate that mm -hmm. for me. I'm just not. Um, I'm not, I don't know that my drawing was that good to begin with, but hmm. I think it's, um, I, I think it's it. good because I didn't get to do, I, I just watched last week because I didn't have the, um, but go ahead. I'm, I'm just rambling. I just watched no, last no, I'm week because I didn't have the reference pictures and so today I oh, did okay. a drawing and I'm so then I'm now I'm going forward okay. with you. Awesome. Well I you know some some of my students paint along with me some of them watch me and then paint something else so I never know what you guys are all yeah. doing. But so are you are you commenting that right now this painting looks too like it's not feeling integrated because of the contrast or are you talking about your own painting? I'm, my I'm own just, painting. Oh, my own oh, painting okay. is the one I'm talking about. No, yours is great. Like oh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I see, I just want to make I sure need, I, know I think the top of my rose needs some darker edge and I think that'll bring it out. I think I've got it too light. Um, on the top of the rose. So tomorrow. On the, the top know. center or like the top edge of the petals? The very you know. top edge of the petal. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've got, it's more of a pink and it needs to be the red. Yeah. Um, yes. So my brush was super duper saturated, it was not very wet to get this intense red. Um, also, depending on the shade of red you have, some of them do lend, do lean towards pink. And that's sort of a, a quest of mine is to try and find reds that I find are like primary red, what I think of as like a primary red and not too orange, not too pink. Um, so I've found that Windsor red is a good one. Naphthol red is another good one. Cadmium red is another good one. Like I think it's cadmium red medium there's like a light medium dark i think it's medium that i feel like is a nice just middle of the road red like a, a mm -hmm. lizard crimson is very pink it wants to be like a violet almost which is great if you actually want to mix a violet use a lizard crimson um i'm trying to think of uh i think things called um i've had tubes of paint just that say crimson or that say scarlet and I can't remember, I think one or two, one or one, maybe it's the crimson that I feel is more middle of the road and the scarlet tends to be more pink. I don't know. Sometimes you just need to, um, you know, get the right red, you know, exactly. To, mm -hmm. And it might just, it might just be the shade of red you're using. That's not getting this like candy cane red color that's in this. this yeah, it's very color. red. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to say like, don't, don't, don't be too hard on yourself. It might actually be the pigments that you're using. So, all right, let's switch. Thank you. If you'd like to join one of my watercolor classes online, I have two different versions for you. I have a live class and I have pre-recorded classes. So my live classes um, meet weekly 
on Tuesdays, I offer a morning class and an afternoon class. You can choose whichever is more convenient for your schedule. And we meet um, all the Tuesdays of a month, mostly. Uh, and then each month, I start a different subject matter. So one month might be flowers, the next month might be animals, the next month might be line and wash technique, the next month might be painting glass. So you can jump in whenever you're interested in a subject matter, or you can just keep taking the classes and just learn all of the different things. I teach my classes in a way that you will learn all the techniques with each subject matter doesn't really matter. And you're always welcome to paint whatever you'd like to paint during that month and get feedback for what you are painting. I offer um, feedback through the modules, the, the lessons for each week that you'll get through the website. And then I offer in the live classes, you can get feedback live if you wish. And you can also ask questions in real time, which is really a benefit. But those live classes are also recorded. So if you have something scheduled and you have to miss, you can just watch the recording later. You do not have to be on camera. You do not have to be um, speak up or talk or anything. I don't call you out. I mostly just um, have a, maybe a short lecture about our technique, show you some artist inspirations. And then I just jump into my demonstration and I just talk throughout the painting so you know exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And then you can jump in and ask questions if you wish. So you can paint along, you can paint after class, whichever works for you. My recorded classes are compiled from my live classes. So I'll take different um, recordings from the month, whichever month I'm doing, and I'll create a recorded class. So you'll get four weeks of content through that as well. And then you can just literally just watch that at your convenience whenever. Um, you don't get the live feedback. And right now I do have a feature where you can email me if you would like feedback on your, 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 on your paintings. But if I get overwhelmed, um, I may have to shut that down. If you're new to watercolor and you um, aren't sure of basic techniques, I recommend my foundations class. I walk you through how to control watercolor step-by-step. Step. I talk about setting up your palette, what kind of supplies you need. And then I walk you through two paintings so you understand how to apply the techniques to painting something like a painting, right? Um, and I do recommend that class, although I feel like I um, am very beginner friendly as well because I definitely want everyone to understand how to control the, this medium. I understand a lot of people don't get um, very thorough instruction with watercolor and I aim to rectify that with my um, classes. So if you're interested, you can find the link below in the caption about how to find what classes are available and how to sign up. And I probably have a coupon code as well that will relate to the recorded class that this demonstration you just watched is applying towards. So I really hope to see you in my classes in the future. And if you have questions, um, please reach out. I would be happy to answer them. Have a great day and happy painting.